It wasn't bad, that was easy. We ain't gonna state none of their names. Some of them dead, some of them living. Yeah, I'm afraid of my life all the time. I know we've been changed. I know we've been changed. The Lord have changed our name. From Logtown to Sandal level. Don't you it's see? A little bit still goes on, but I think it's for, for the foremost, it's, it's really changed, yeah. Like. Just give us stuff to do so we won't go out and sell drugs and stuff like that. This documentary is about a town with two sides. When you hear Logtown, you think of drugs, crime, and violence. When you hear Sandy Level, you think of accomplishments, hope, and future. Logtown and Sandy Level are the two names of this small community in rural Axton, Virginia. Logtown derives from the log cabins that once dominated the community. Sandy Level is the official name of the community. Through this documentary, the citizens of Sandy Level will experience a portion of their history and a glimpse of their future. Other communities will gain knowledge on how Logtown has transformed into Sandy Level and continues to push for higher heights. Ultimately, all viewers will gain insight on how their actions affect the lives of family, friends, and their community. In 1996, an article was published in a U.S. News and World Report entitled, Crack Invade Small Town. In this article, Logtown Sandy Level was depicted as a drug-infested neighborhood that was held hostage by drug dealers. One quote stated, People in Sandy Level don't take to their porches anymore, not even on sultry summer nights when the warm breeze has barely enough breath to rustle the slender loblolly pines. The nights belong to the boys. These are the 25 teenagers, give or take a few, who have Sandy Level under siege. Equipped with a stunning arsenal of firearms, they sell drugs around the clock, shoot out street lights for sport, and take aim at customers who dare to give them guff. Were drugs easily accessible in Logtown Sandy Level in the 1990s? Absolutely, yeah. Anything you can name. Name. You could get your crack, you could get your weed. Everybody was mostly selling drugs, you know what I mean? But, you know, a nephew, all of them was just easy to get. Translated, people walking. It was always around. No matter where you go, it was around. You could get your heroin, you could get your crank. It was the thing, the thing people were doing. I mean, you know, it was, it was the, 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 the thing. Drugs, yeah. You had people from all, everybody was in drug scene. You know what I'm saying? From grandmas to uh, on down to the grandbabies. It was, it was pretty rough. You know, it was, it was family oriented, but it was, it was kind of rough down through here at that time. You know, it was. Pills, you could get your speed, you, you name it, you could get it. It was all around us. It seemed like everybody that started doing it, so it was almost impossible to stay away from. I was incarcerated right. by the time the nanas got there, but in 85, when Ronald Reagan and Oliver North got in office, that's when drugs became accessible in Logtown, and it changed our way of life, my nigga, because before 1985, with Ronald Reagan and Oliver North, we was bailing hay, pulling tobacco, digging ditches. Not only the men, but even the girls in Logtown. Maybe some of y'all's mother, whether you realize it or not, I mean, out there pulling to back, women getting in like me for $20 a day. What were people doing to get oh those drugs? Hey, sky's the limit. 
No limits. No, I stole, stole, took money. You saw, you saw, I took my, I'm sorry I did so. Basically, everything and anything to get it, we did it. You know, we did it. You know, we did it. You know, as far as stealing, you know, no killing. You know, we're just stealing. You know what I'm saying? Take it from your family, man. It was the worst part. You know, it was the worst part. It was the worst part. You know what I'm saying? You leave a pocket look around, it was gone. Your money was gone. Being that drugs were easily accessible in Logtown Sandy Level, many lives were impacted and many lives were destroyed. That's what affects the gang on drugs, it affects people, other people. They end up getting hurt, shot, or killed. How has uh, drugs affected your life? Wish I'd never started. <laughs> I, uh, to me, financial wise, cost me a marriage for one thing, but I tell you like this, and why I won't lose this marriage over no drugs. Yeah, I've been a fool, yeah. Yeah, I've been there, done that. Hated it, for the most part, yeah. So, you know, I've been affected, but it seemed to have made me stronger. Yeah, it made, it, it made, drugs made my life real, real difficult. Cause it seemed like I, one time I lost all my friends cause I started smoking, you know. I don't know why, I had quit loving myself, I had to get some of the drugs. I was the biggest drug smoker in the world. You take my tongues, I seen, I seen some of the boys, not calling in two of them. Stuff would kick you on my tongue, that thick right there. I see two boys down there that's like it. I mean, when, you know what, when that stuff is on your tongue, you think all kinds of crazy stuff until that stuff get off the tongue. But like I say, and when you smoke that stuff, you think all kinds of crazy, that stuff makes think all kinds of crazy stuff, you know what I mean? And you smoke that stuff. I don't smoke it no more. Despite the negative impact of drugs on the community, many in Sandy Level were offended, even outraged by the 1996 article. This was their home, not the streets of some war zone, but to outsiders, it was a place to fear, a place of hopelessness, a place perceived so bad that there were talks of putting a small police unit in the neighborhood. I began here in 1993. I was assigned to corrections and it had been the reputation and the incidents were becoming so bad they would put extra patrols there and a corrections officer would ride with one of their trained patrol officers and I was told I was one of the first. I began, I paired up with what was uh, uh, Doug Sharp who was a patrol officer then and I think he was a supervisor but the primary officer would go in patrol area and like on that instance I would sit in passenger seat with a shotgun in my lap that's how bad it had gotten we would go in the areas uh, several of the cars our patrol cars had been rocked I remember going through the Academy and some of the training films that we watched undercover video surveillance was just becoming available and the training films that they had were from down in the Sandy Level area and people standing out on doing street sales while I remember one in particular a man had made a shoulder holster for a, a sawed off shotgun and he was known to be very violent. Uh, the shootings, the things that took place, uh, it was uh, a, it, it, it was just something to behold. In the mid-90s, uh, that's when I first started the Sheriff's Office. I'd been there a short while. Uh, when we would get calls to Logtown, if we got a call, of course, we responded, but if it was something where we were just going to do patrol, they preferred that we even went in groups because it just the uh, drug problem was really out of hand. Uh, when you even heard the word Logtown, people got concerned. They thought it was just you know, a really violent place. And when you say out of hand, can you tell what that looks like or what were some of the things that uh, made it to be considered out of hand? Yes, sir, a lot of open air drug dealing. I mean, just right there, right on the streets. There was no, you know, even trying to hide or disguise it. 
Uh, you had some individuals down there who were pretty confident in what they were doing and, and thought they were, I guess, above the law or that they had people intimidated where people weren't going to, you know, tell on them or anything of that nature. How much time would you say your office spent dealing with uh, issues in Logtown during that mid-90s? As far as patrol went, I mean, you know, we had a, a large majority of calls, but I would say the drug unit itself, which I, I became a part of in the late 90s, um, probably the primary focus was Logtown. There were several murders there. It was regularly a place where people got beat up, and this could be people uh, fighting each other over the drug territory, or sometimes in an open air drug market when people come in, somebody will just beat them up and take their money and rob them. But one of the, probably the maddest I ever got, we were doing reversals, and what a reversal is, is we chase off the drug dealers and then we go in and put undercover police officers standing there for the stream of people that come in from North Carolina who don't know any better. And one day in particular, we had caught a man and a woman and they had two small children in the back seat of their car. And this was in a time frame where a lot of violence still occurred. And I remember yelling at that man and that woman for what they had brought those two children into that were sitting in the back seat of the car wide-eyed. And the tragedy of the young children the biggest impact of drugs are children who are brought into this world who didn't ask to be brought into this world and then aren't loved, who aren't fed, who aren't cared for out of this tragedy. And that's probably the most moving thing for me. A lot of times we'd be down there and you would just see the way uh, people, there was a certain fear from the good people. They were afraid even of their own family members sometimes because uh, some of the people that were involved in this uh, drug trade had, they, they felt invincible and they were mistreating their own family. Uh, there were some female individuals in the area that had really started getting taken advantage of. They got them hooked on drugs and then had them doing uh, so, some just really things I wouldn't even really want to go into, but some, some really decadent activity. Um, the children, again, getting back to them, who I probably felt the most sorry for because, I mean, they would just be out there and they had no direction, they had no one really guiding them. Uh, young people were very impressionable and they were looking up to these guys because, you know, they see a guy with some money, some, you know, nice shoes, nice clothes, some, some bling as they call it on them. You know, they was thinking that was a lifestyle. And, and why Logtown? You know, why did Logtown become that? Drug spot. I think pretty much just the proximity. It's just right across the line is Eden, and a lot of people can. Now it's much better, but before stepping just across the North Carolina line was putting them in a whole different environment. They were unknown, but communications has gotten so good now. Any working relationship, now Pennsylvania County is a huge county, but they move efforts to work the Cascade area. Eden has gotten much better about working with us because we know these drug dealers are just using that little line to step back and forth across. And Danville as well, some of the little roads that connect Danville, Cascade, Eden, and Sandy Level, they just really used the geographic boundaries there to their advantage, and, and good people suffered. That area was the central location between Florida and New York. So it was the perfect mid-location for drug trafficking. Uh, it was off of a main interstate, so it, you could use some side roads, back roads, and uh, because of the uh, economic status of our area, which has gotten even worse to this date, um, they were able to kind of get a foothold and, and, you know, it was easy money. It was easy money. Uh, the Logtown area was not easy to get to. You know, as far as law enforcement, you know, the person working the east end of the county, Logtown's kind of separate, you know, border North Carolina line. And, you know, you could be some time away to, to get to a call. I think, I think a lot of it was getting brought here and delivered initially. Uh, I think after a while, after a uh, you know, they established some people here. They start making trips and, you know, because I, I know some people in the area that would make trips to New York or. So we got to connect to New York 
New York was bringing it to Law Town. You know what I'm saying? Five, six, seven, eight, nine kilos at a time. Guys out here that was trying to do what they do to get money and, you know, won't try to work. So, you know, you pretty much know just being what it was. It was a lot of drugs being sold and, you know, there are a lot of killings and stuff like that. But, you know, a lot of them guys, they're incarcerated or they've been incarcerated and back out and doing the right thing and stuff. But, you know, in that era, yes, it was pretty rough. Although the 1996 article was not well received by many in the neighborhood, no one could deny that Logtown had a major drug problem. And where there are drugs, there's crime. As the violence increased, so did the concern for the neighborhood. Families began losing loved ones at an alarming rate. I lose family members every day and I can't put it on, I can't point no name or bad no blame because drugs and violence was here before I was born. It, it wasn't a drug that you sniff or smoke, but it was maybe a drug in a cup or alcohol or something like that and people were dying and getting killed for that. My name is Virginia Dillard. I lost a son, a good son, the act of violence. Shane Tinsley, Sokolin Tinsley. My name is Earlene Little Dillard. Um, as we journey from day to day, we don't know when uh, our life will be sh shaken. And on June the 23rd, 1990, uh, my mother was fatally shot by a man she was dating. How has the death affected you and your family? It affected us because he was always there for each one of us and we miss him very severely. And it affected the whole family because we miss him, we need him, and we loved him. It affected quite a bit, but it's made us strong. Uh, we was uh, informed uh, of what had happened. We were very, you know, in shock and we, um, there was deep pain. Yeah, like man, it's just so bad. Like in, you know, in 2009 when my nephew AJ got killed. Man, it's crushed me, man. I mean, I went through a period in here where I was like, I was so down for about a year to where I didn't want to communicate with my family or none of my friends on the street. And people was really worried about me. And I didn't understand that, like I said, I've been around people getting killed. But when it hit home to somebody like your nephew, Like that. Yeah. Boy, that's, that's tough. What's your advice to others who are dealing with a violent death of a loved one? Just trust in God. Pray and talk to the Lord and just think of other people who have lost a child or through violence and remember they are suffering along with you. Pray, pray, pray. Just keep on praying. God is, is with you. Uh, stay encouraged, encourage one another, and uh, as I stated, God is, is with you all. The reputation of Logtown grew to the point where it affected how outsiders, including businesses, viewed the community. Many people were afraid to visit or to drive through the community. Some businesses were willing to lose money instead of providing a service to the citizens of Logtown. They got, you got people yeah. scared they ain't come to the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. People go and try to get uh, things done to the yard, the driveway paved, whatever. Everybody's scared to come to Logtown because of stuff that happened years ago. Outside of Logtown, they looked at us as outsiders, man. Look at one time, we, they even, we couldn't even get into a restaurant. If, if we went to a restaurant, go to Apple. Police would be up there. They found out that we were lost from Logtown. They wouldn't even serve us, man. They was like, you from Logtown, you can't come in here. That's, that's, that's the rap that we had. See, people get on, they can't maintain. Stupid shooting and killing and going on. Doing stupid stuff. But other people from the other neighborhood come here. 
make our neighborhood look bad, which, which we can't go to their neighborhood and do what they do up here. You meet somebody, if you got a job, you're working, you meet somebody, they're scared to come visit you because of the, the name Longtown got. As far as drugs, whatever, you know. Yeah, I mean, Town. drugs, got, they got a big impact on Longtown, whatever, you know. Okay. Longtown have a bad name. I would say we probably had two, anywhere from two to four murders a year generally happening in that area. The arrests were new. Um, I wouldn't hesitate to say 20 to 30 people a year were arrested and indicted out of the area. But then as you mentioned, just the devastation and the effects of the drugs, that will be something that lasts through generations, unfortunately. Uh, many, many more lives were affected just by the mere fact that drugs were easily accessible. And one of the big things that always strikes me about a drug dealer is how do you do this, and, I'm, and this applies to anyone, how do you do this to your fellow man? How do you see what takes place, what it turns people into, and you do that to people and see what follows afterwards with the devastation for children? I, I just have to shake my head. How do you do that? Talk about, because I know that Logtown has a lot of young men. Talk about those young men that were lost and how, the different ways that young men were lost. Uh, in the game. In the game, in the community, life. Talk about that some. Uh, some of the guys, you know what I'm saying, you had good guys, man, that would, you know, they were going to get their education, you know what I'm saying, they were going to school. But once they got introduced to the game, you know what I'm saying? Everything turned around. You know what I'm saying? They put the gun in the hand, they put the drugs in the hand. Everything changed. Everything. Everything changed about them. You know, I mean, guys you could come up, you know, talk to, you know what I'm saying? They were beating up people, you know what I'm saying? You know, they get bunched up, man. You know, they quit school. You know, a lot of them lost a lot of educated people. They did. They lost a lot of educated guys, you know, to the drug game because Guys put dope in their hand, promise some money, you know what I'm saying, put money in their hand, you know what I'm saying, and everything changed. And guys started making money, they didn't go to school, they forgot what, they, what, what was going on, you know, everything. It was crazy. It was, it was crazy. And we know about the violence and the people that were killed through violence. What about those who went to jail? How, how does that impact the community when a generation of young men are incarcerated. Well, my opinion and my own opinion, they took away a lot of guys getting good jobs and the education, their, their mind frame, and now those guys can't get a good job. You know, they can't become, you know, they can't become, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of jobs that they missed out on, man, because of their background, you know. You know, they, they got felonies, you know what I'm saying, on top of felonies, and then, you know, a lot of guys that I hear can't make our generation go, you know, grow. Our generation won't grow because these guys in jail, you know. You, you talked about the bad. What's your hope for Sandy Level? in uh, years to come? My hope is Lawtown will grow as a family. Will grow as a community. Will grow as a citizen. And they continue to educate their people. And they will learn from our mistakes. And 
through this experience, through this life that you've talked about, what have you learned? I learned that I messed my life up. I messed my life 